Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Shad wana Muhammad Rasulullah. Ashad wana Muhammad Rasulullah. Hayya del Haya del Sole Haya del Fole Haya del Fole Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول Allahu Akbar, 
صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستنصره نعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات عمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يذلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين ورضي الله عن المهاجرين والأنصار ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين عما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط وأنزلنا الحديد فيه بأس شديد ومنافع للناس وليعلم الله من ينصره ورسله بالغيب إن الله قوي عزيز Bismillah. Last week, unfortunately, the Sheikh was busy given that it was the end of the semester and was in a circumstance in which he could not give the khutbah. This week, unfortunately, he has been suffering from health challenges and complications. Which is quite unfortunate. I would assume that the stress level is very high, especially given the current circumstances that we are all witnessing in Palestine today. Together, the stress of being a professor and all that that entails, dealing with health problems regularly, and the great grief that burdens him and burdens us all. Unfortunately, this week, he fell ill and was not in a state in which he felt happy and able, prepared to give this khutbah. Thus, I'll do my best to fill the podium space. If I offer something of value, alhamdulillah. And if I misspeak, um, it is my own fault and not the fault of my teacher. In the khutbah today, I want to expand and move on to a different nexus point um, to continue our discussion from last week. But in order to do so, I will summarize very quickly some of the main points of last week's khutbah in order to be able to to transition to what I think is worth mentioning this week. Last week we discussed the weaponization of morality for the sake of personal gain. And we also discussed its opposite, a commitment to moral thinking and its prioritization over personal gain. We did so by examining the example, the historical example of the tribe of Banu Nadir during the time of the Muslims. And we did so by analyzing the allegory 
uh, of the palm trees which were planted in front of their fortress. We said that these palm trees perhaps represented moral values, a veneer, if you will, behind which Banu Nadir attempted to mask the rot of their treachery, their deceit, and from behind it, they waged their war against the Muslims. One of the reasons that I said this last week, and I didn't mention it in that khutbah, and I'll mention it now, is due to a verse that comes later in the surah. The verse about the palm trees comes in the first five, six verses, and it goes on after the palm trees to talk about the splitting of the war booty and the moral challenge that that presented for the Muslims at the time, given their extreme financial destitution, which is a whole topic of its own. Another success by the Muslims, moral success. And it returns to the moral failure of Banu Nadir and those who stand against the Muslims, or at least the Muslims of that time. And it says of them, my I translate, translate this to mean that they will not fight you or oppose you collectively, save in fortified strongholds or from behind walls. Their discord or their conflict between themselves is fierce. You suppose that they are together, yet their hearts are divided. That is because they are a people who lack moral sense. This is the verse that made me think that the palm trees were yet another allegory. Because I read this verse also as an allegory. Yes, technically, Banu Nadir had a fortress, a castle, and it protected them from the siege of the Muslims and they couldn't meet out an open battle. This is correct. However, is God in this instance making a comment on the lack of courage of Banu Nadir from fighting from behind walls. We think back to Surah As-Saf, which we mentioned in the previous khutbah. In the tafsir, our teacher mentioned, in modern warfare, in comparison to medieval warfare, being in ranks, in solid ranks, in close proximity, is not necessarily helpful or useful. The enemy knows exactly where you are and can cause a blast radius that would cause significant damage. So there is a more metaphorical understanding of what the saf or the ranks mean. And that's a moral unanimity, a moral solidarity. Here, when they say, or when Allah says that they will not fight you collectively, save in a fortified stronghold or from behind a wall, immediately what came to my mind was not only the stone from behind which they opposed the Muslims, but the palm trees. And they didn't say anything about why are you shooting towards our stone walls. They took the opposition with the palm trees because the palm trees was a unified symbol amongst the Arabs <coughs> in the peninsula of something that was beautiful, of moral value, something that anyone and anyone, everybody could feel, feel the impact of the loss. And they accused them of being immoral uh, and of being militarily expedient and throwing aside an ethical standard by which they decided, the Muslims were talking about ethics and morality. They said, if you're so ethical and so moral, then why would you cut down the palm trees that are beloved to us all? And so we said that the palm trees today have changed. The metaphor of the palm trees has changed today. Today they stand as the United Nations as a whole, the United States of America, the ideals of democracy, the ideals of international law, the ideals of free press and free speech, 
all of these are weaponized. They uh, are almost like a tank. They protect the aggressor when anyone levels any ac accusation in their direction. And from within the tank, they can also shoot and accuse other parties of a lack of sophistication, moral sophistication, and an inability or a refusal to abide by what the international standards are, which they very summarily divide into terrorism and non-terrorism. But there was a very interesting bit of language in last week's khutbah that I detailed that caught my attention. That was the nexus between the language of cutting down the palm tree standing on its roots and the nexus between another verse in the Musabbihat, the five surahs that start with Sabbahalillah or some variation of the, of the sort that arised in Surah Al-Jum'ah when the Prophet is left standing at the pulpit as the Muslims ran to make purchases uh, because merchants did not come to Medina often. There was a very close similarity between the language. I won't repeat it here because you can refer to the previous khutbah. What I found very interesting about these five surahs is they tend to have a verse or two that use a very obscure style of language that's not all that common in the Qur'an that almost seem to point as a connection point, a node, to another surah. One of them in Surah Al-Hashr has a node with Surah Al-Hadid. In Surah Al-Hadid, the verse that I quoted at the very beginning, the translation reads as, we have indeed sent our messengers with clear proofs and we sent down the book and the balance, the mizan, with them, such that the people would uphold justice. And we sent down iron, wherein is great conflict or difficulty and benefits or goodness for mankind. There, there is this very interesting language, ba'sun shadid. The Ba'sun Shadid that we read about in Surah Al-Hashr was this conflict, this seeming projection of a unanimous front that, again the word, projected strength to the Muslims and made them feel surprised or perhaps even doubtful as to whether their military campaign or their standing up to Banu Nadir would be successful because there was a projection from Banu Nadir that we are strong, we have strong allies, we are behind stone walls, and we have these palm trees, and we have the language of morality that we can wage upon you as a weapon to be an interlocutor uh, in this psychological warfare, so to speak. That was the way that the word was used, ba'sun, or the phrase rather, ba'sun shadid, ba'suhum baynahum shadid. But that same type of language also arises in Surah Al Hadid in the verse, in the instance that we just said. And we sent down iron wherein there is great conflict or difficulty, as I have translated it, and manafi, benefits or goodness for mankind. So again, ba'sun shadid arises. There are several other instances in the Quran where ba's or ba'sun shadid refers to a military or military might, but those are quite separate and quite obviously not linked to something here that can be read very metaphorically. I refer us quickly 
to a few verses before to understand the impact of the verse, the main verse, I think. Uh, and I think perhaps the tafsir might agree as it highlights this verse as the dhikr, the very special verse in Surah Al-Hadid. But something to consider here. There is a verse, a few verses before, just a few verses before, that says, ما أصاب من مصيبة في الأرض ولا في أنفسكم إلا في كتاب من قبل أن نبرأها إن ذلك على الله يسير. The translation is, no calamity befalls the earth or yourselves except that it is from God's decree before we bring it into being. Verily, that is easy for God. The point here that I want us to emphasize and think about is the challenge of calamity, the challenge of trauma, the challenge of conflict. And immediately after that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives more context to understand the verse before it. Why? Why is there, why would Allah decree the reality, not the specifics, but decree the possibility for trauma and difficulty. He says, Know so that you do not know this, this is so that you do not despair over what good has escaped you or exult unduly over what good has come to you. God likes not the self centered or the self-absorbed. I've taken some liberty with that translation, but this is how I understand the verse. The self-absorbed and the self-centered. What is the contrast? The contrast comes a mere verse or two later, which we discussed. That we have sent our messengers, we have sent the book, we have sent the proofs, and we have sent with them the balance, the mizan, so that people will rise, uphold, establish justice. What is the connection between trauma, conflict, difficulty, pain, these great teachers, and the concept of balance? And if you look into the tafsir, the concept of al-hadid. The tafsir talks about how al-hadid is a metaphorical example for the soul of a believing just person who undergoes the fire of transformation through pain and difficulty and out of that re-emerges and molds like a solid piece of iron, strong, principled, unshakable, undeterrable, in order to uphold what the messengers have sent with the clear proofs, which is establishing the balance. Aqouli qouli hada, mustaghfiran li wa lakum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين. I know that first surah is a uh, the first khutbah is a heavy lift, <coughs> but maybe if we go through a few examples, we can think about how to make sense of the first khutbah. There's a recent report from CNN. And a day or so ago, about the changing approach, the change in language that the White House and America in general, the American government in general, but the changing language that the White House is using with regards to the Israeli government and Israel's uh, military operation in Gaza. Some of, it, some of it reads, Joe Biden held Israel closer than any American president ever, in, ever has in the horrific days after the Hamas attacks on October 7th. 
But more than two months later, following days upon following days upon end of Israeli strikes in Gaza that have killed thousands of civilians, unprecedented tensions over the war are widening between the White House and the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Biden accused Israel, for example, of carrying out indiscriminate bombing in an off-camera political event this week. He used exceedingly blunt language, which typically causes pushback from Israel's leaders, who insist they try to spare civilians, but accuse Hamas of using innocent Palestinians as cover. Diplomatic rifts are deepening as a new U.S. intelligent assessment, exclusively reported by CNN on Thursday, shows that nearly half of the air-to-ground munitions used by Israel in Gaza have been unguided, not precision, unguided so-called quote-unquote dumb bombs. This is an amazing example of ba'suhum baynahum shadid. At the beginning of this conflict, there was almost a 100% tacit green light approval from Biden's administration. Israel could do no wrong. Palestinians couldn't even be bothered to be mentioned. In fact, Biden st stood at a lectern and lied openly about seeing pictures of decapitated Israeli babies. He never apologized. He never walked it back. There was a half sentence from... Uh, the press, whoever is in charge of the press with the White House, that said, well, perhaps he hasn't seen it, and those reports, as they were obviously debunked, um, did not come from a source that we are aware of, etc., etc. Uh, he's just repeating what he heard. A very quiet walk back, not a public one, and not one done by Joe Biden himself. Nonetheless, that was the language that he was employing knowing full well that that would result in genocide. I do wonder whether this language has begun to change given the recent polls that seem to suggest upwards of 60 or 70 percent of Democrats fully oppose Joe Biden's response to the military operation in Gaza, the overwhelming international pressure from both um, demonstrators but also a near-unanimous UN declaration that opposed uh, the war in Gaza and called for a ceasefire. It seems that the White House is starting to realize that the Israeli government and project has become much like a rabid dog whom they thought they had a leash on them and clearly have zero to no control over what is happening. And it's starting to break, burst at the seams. The conflict is starting to show. And it seems that the U.S. is concerned about its regional partners and its other goals in other regions. And Israel is once again proving to be one of the weakest points or a weak Achilles heel for the United States. Let's look at another few news items. This is from NBC News, and this is from early December. They speak about a video which was filmed about two weeks after the, a hospital was evacuated. If you remember, there was, when they took over the hospitals in Gaza during their ground assault, there was alarm bells being rang by the international community, doctors without borders, etc., etc that the uh, natal care units were um, going to be shut down, the ch children and the babies would not be able to be cared for, and they had a lot of issues, and they said, leave the hospitals alone, and they said, no, 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 we must go into the hospital because it is a base, and there is a list, uh, as we, that was a funny video that then got mocked for another month, to try to beef up the Israeli propaganda as to why they can flatten any and every structure, universities, mosques, churches, hospitals, etc. In any case, they, evacu they evacuated this hospital, despite the international outcry about 
what would amount to a general palm tree, the lives of children, newborns. It says that the, after, two weeks after the hospital was evacuated, they go in and they have uh, film footage, which appears to show at least three of the five dead infants with their bodies putrefying in close proximity to catheters and ventilators. One baby is seen decomposing while lying alone, appearing to still be connected to an oximeter with a green oxygen tank nearby. Insects appear to crawl on its chest. A bed sheet is used as a soft pillow and an empty bottle and a medical glove box are shown closer to the bed's edge, etc., etc. And just this week, Jazeera reported, and it was not just reports because they published the eyewitness accounts from the individuals who uh, gave this testimony. Civilians sheltering inside a Gaza school killed execution style. Family members searching for missing loved ones say they found their dead bodies inside classrooms killed execution style. The dead included men, elderly people, women, children, and even newborn babies. What does Israel and the United States have to say about this? We saw images of flipped cribs immediately after October 7th. No reports, no international bodies to come in to verify exactly what happened, no investigation, and immediately everyone was to take the hearsay of the Israeli government, who are known to be open liars at this point. If you take anything that the Israeli government says at face value, I do not hesitate in calling you an absolute idiot. You are an idiot if you accept what they say. The fact that Joe Biden can stand up there and immediately say, well, that's the Gaza health ministry, so we don't really know the amount of dead. Then, you know what? This is going to be a he said, she said, hearsay until the last moment. As far as I'm concerned, anything Israel says is a lie until proven absolutely true. Unless it is them admitting to their own crimes, then I'll, I'll believe them, which they are doing on a consistent basis. Yet another report came out from their own news channel that seems to suggest, yet again, the grave vast majority of the dead and the destruction that came from the Nova Festival had to do with Israeli helicopters opening fire on its own people, exercising the Hannibal Doctrine, because they were terrified. They didn't know how to respond, so they just shot everybody. Go and review the footage of the kibbutz. There were tank marks all over the grass. Rooms are blown apart. What kind of weaponry do we think that Hamas has? Who blew that place up? Their own survivors say, and they have shut them up now, their own survivors say that their family members were killed in crossfire. We saw images of the flipped cribs and it was the big bad wolf Hamas with claws and long nails and big bushy tails came and cut off body parts and baked children alive and did etc 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 no corroboration we don't even have on record the people who have said this the eyewitness testimony we don't even have them recorded here we have civilians a great number of them, who are all reporting the exact same thing. They had to evacuate the school. They came back days later, looking for their children, and they found dead bodies with bullet holes in the back of their heads. There is an international outcry at this suggestion of any harm towards an Israeli newborn child, anything of the sort. They made an absolute stink about, oh, it's believe all women until Israeli women claim to be sexually assaulted. Yet again, 
They weaponize and put place veneers on the rotting teeth of the lies from the lies that they are perpetuating and spray mouthwash or something to try to hold back the stink of their moral decrepitness, accuse the entire world of doing something and do the exact same themselves. I think a lot of us have been re-following Norman Finkelstein in the last 60 days. Obviously, Professor Norman, Norman Finkelstein is a celebrated political scientist who dedicated the vast majority of his scholarship to Palestine and Gaza in specific, and is an expert in the field, and an, another expert in, in understanding international law, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he spoke at great length about how, for the last few years, he felt that the world had given up on Gaza in particular, because he, Norman Finkelstein, had also given up and thought that there was no recourse. All of the work that he had put in hours and hours and hours in his mind accounted or amounted to nothing. And then he woke up to the news as the way that he sees it. That the Holocaust that's replaying in his mind, the concentration camp had been broken out of by those who were imprisoned inside of it. And he wrote a long post celebrating and full of joy at seeing this day. This is the way that he puts it in a way I'm, I'm paraphrasing. That they broke out of the prison. He was elated. As time went on, it became more clear to him that perhaps some atrocities occurred on October the 7th, and he immediately then found himself in a moral quandary. What he admits is a difficult thing for him often because he often would rely on his mother for his moral quandaries and with his mentor, Professor Noam Chomsky, who in this situation, for one reason or another, was unable to provide him with moral clarity that he seeked. So he resorted to reading old records from black abolitionists, and he comes across the well-known narrative of Nat Turner, whom he deems a very educated man, a man who was very literate with the Bible. He was no dummy, is how he puts it, essentially. And essentially, he carries out an attack akin to a slave revolt where it is reported that he killed pretty much indiscriminately, him and his band of people who agreed with him to take, out, take on sort of action, went into bedrooms and killed babies and did horrible things. Now, this was not a precedent for which he then jumped at to say this was agreeable because ultimately what Nat Turner did put pressure on the American government and the American people and the American culture to say, let these people, you know, breathe and free them from slavery or else they'll kill us all. That was not his point. He was not celebrating Nat Turner. But he was looking for something to understand. He was looking for something to humanize a already dehumanized population who were then able to rehabilitate over time although that is not to be reducive or reductive towards the plight of black Americans in this country and around the world. Nonetheless, with respect to the professor, I wonder sometimes if had he been a Muslim, he would have had the tools he needed to be able to evaluate moral quandaries in a better fashion. I'm not criticizing him. But it seems that for his entire life, God forgive me if I'm wrong, he constantly saw the Holocaust in his mind's eye 
and saw the terrors and the horrors of it, hearing from it as his parents were Holocaust survivors and watching his mother deal with a great amount of hatred towards Germans afterward. And he tells a story about how he brought a German friend but did not disclose that he was German, something of the like, and ultimately the best that the mother could do was to not speak to the person or share a single word or something. That was the best she could do. Professor Finkelstein, and I appreciate him, is trying to explain something to an audience that you have to understand where violence and this sort of conflict and trauma comes from. What could push somebody to kill another human being, let alone engage in killing a youth? Norman Finkelstein's answer to try to appeal to an American Western public who already sees Palestinians and Muslims as barely human beings. Well, they are human beings after all, and if you push somebody hard enough, they may have no other choice, and they let out the steam, and that causes violence. But where he's correct is ultimately it is the mistake and the crime it originally belongs to that of the oppressor. A final point to round out the difference between those who are stuck in a moral quandary and those who are raised and commit themselves to an environment and to an ideology, to a set of principles and how they react to trauma and to calamity. We all know the celebrated journalist Wa'il Dahdouh, the Al Jazeera journalist, who some weeks ago, his entire family was slaughtered. And he survived. And the following day, he went right back to work. No time to grieve. And I saw a clip, maybe many of you have seen it, in which he is sitting with a 14-year-old, or 8th grader, as she says, amputee, and he's consoling her, and he's telling her, we believe in God. We believe that God chooses for us to undergo and experience calamities. And it's our response uh, is what matters. If God wishes to take your legs, then that is his business. And we submit to his will, and we continue on resisting. Muqawwama, he says. We con continue our resistance. And what I hope for you is to continue your education, to become the beautiful human being that you can be, and to realize all of your potentials, despite what has happened to you, that it not be a barrier for your success, for your upholding of truth and balance, but in fact it be the pathway for you to uphold the beauty and the balance that God expects of us as human beings, but also specifically as Muslims. Let us now return to the conceptually dense material that I presented in the first khutbah. The big question that a lot of people have in their lives, but in particular in moments of war or other severe calamities, is if God exists, why can't he just make it all go away? Isn't that then God's fault? Evil exists because God allows it to, they say. Though I think that that's a conversation to have. So why doesn't he just make it go away? If he's so all-powerful and he asks you to pray to him and pray to, you know, at his altar or pray in his church or his synagogue or his mosque or whatever have you. Everyone is asking and begging in Gaza and Yemen and all over the place 
please God, will you spare my children? Some children are spared and some children are slaughtered and some children are maimed. Men, women, elderly, all people. And this becomes a point where people break. They really struggle. And it produces a number of different types of human beings. One example is Norman Finkelstein, someone who has inherited the trauma of perhaps one of the worst human events in human history, the Holocaust. And I could imagine if I was Professor Finkelstein, hearing the stories of my parents and of the grandparents, I would almost wish that I was there to try to do something different. I would wish that I was part of the Warsaw Ghetto uprisings, that I could do something. And I think that if I understand him correctly, he sees the world in terms, well, let's think about it. What is the thing that we always hear with regards to the Holocaust? It's almost a principled dogma. Never again. Never again. Norman Finkelstein, Professor Norman Finkelstein, being the contrarian that he was, thought critically about this and said, yes, never again is a fantastic moral principle that I would like to uphold. And he had the courage to try to commit himself to finding out the full truth about what never again really meant. He challenged himself. But did he have all of the tools that were available to him? Did he have the concept of purification that comes at the beginning of Surah Al-Jum'ah? Did he understand the value of revelation and its integral connection with wisdom? Professor Finkelstein is an incredibly wise individual. But if you coupled that wisdom with what purifies one in our religion and what gives moral precedent when one finds themselves in a moral quandary, that's when one's wisdom and rationality truly shines. And you see that example in someone like the journalist Wa'il Dahdu, who seems to be a social worker, a journalist, a religious figure, a civilian, a res hero, resistance hero, a role model, plays all of these roles. And it comes from the value that this very beautiful verse presents in Surah Al-Hadid. He was met with trauma, unimaginable calamity. Anyone else in his position, it would be completely understood that they would fall apart. In fact, it might even be understood that he would pick up a gun and walk into a kibbutz and shoot everybody, according to Professor Finkelstein's standards. Not excusing it, but understanding it. Wa'ala Dahdu says no. What I am here to do is to reset the balance. The balance is in imbalance. Someone has come and set it apart, has put the wazn in an in a unbalanced position. And they've done that through spreading darkness in the form of murder, occupation, land theft, cultural theft, etc., etc., etc. He comes and tries to set it straight. How? By going into Israel proper and murdering? What does Israel think about this? How does Israel think? How do we make sense of the grand failure? See, we said that the palm trees in the previous khutbah were but a veneer covering the rot. What is the main 
origin of this rot. The argument that Israelis have made for the last 75 years, and more, by the way, is anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. There is no safe place for Jews. There's a safe place for everybody else, it seems, but not for Jews. To quote someone that once wrote an email to our institute, Israel needed to be a grain of rice in a sea of sand, an extremely racist trope, that she seemed to have created herself, which is amazing because I tried to search for this phrase and I could find it nowhere. She invented it, which is amazing. This grain of rice that is Israel decides that never again really means never again by any means necessary. Jews will not be killed, is what Israel says on our watch. They will never be killed for any reason other than natural causes, perhaps. And the way that we will secure that reality is we will mow the lawn in Gaza, as Professor Finkelstein very brilliantly puts, or at least he used it, because that's an actual quote from the Israeli military. It's operations in Gaza every few years. They call it mowings of the lawn. They will mow the lawn in Gaza, and before that, they displaced 700,000 Palestinians. They murdered and burnt down villages, 50, 60, God knows how many. The occupation that takes place in Gaza and the West Bank as well. Everyone knows. And they have no problem doing so because never again. Before the Palestinians ever had a chance to put up a fight, they were already waging the war of never again. They were preemptively striking, killing, and they thought that they had the license because they suffered. What did we say earlier? We said that what God doesn't like in terms of the people, see, at first he says, know that the trauma, the conflict, the calamity that comes upon you, know that it is so that you learn the concept of not despairing what good has escaped you, nor unduly exulting over what good has come to you. And then God says, he likes not the self-centered and the self-absorbed. When he shows up the next day to work, to serve his community, is a human being, and he is in grief, and we are in grief with him. But he also recognizes that he needs to try to set the balance right. And he teaches this to us by showing up the next day. Brave as hell. Counseling this child on his two minutes off. And today, apparently, suffering shrapnel wounds and having his cameraman shot. Yet another assassination attempt. That is a man who understands this surah, this Qur'an, this religion, this God, this prophet. He has no moral quandary. Vengeance is darkness. Hate is darkness. Anger is human. But if it's not regulated with principles, with purification, with healing, with godliness, it will be your undoing. It will be the bacteria and the virus that rots your breath so much that your teeth turn black and your breath stinks and you have to go to a specialist to put on a veneer to lie and wage your war from behind a new set of palm trees. The palm trees were the manifestation 
a but a manifestation. But the rot comes from an uncontrolled, unthoughtful, immoral, ungodly response to what God promises us will come our way. It is the nature of our existence. We do not exist to never experience calamity. We experience beautiful good times and safety, and we experience death. We experience old age. We experience financial loss. We experience disease. We experience car crashes, murder. All of the things that happen to other people, but shouldn't happen to us. God forbid. Yes, God forbid. But ultimately, everyone's time comes in one way or another. Everyone is challenged in one way or another. The people of Gaza are in a very clear challenge. Survive. Try not to become hateful people. Take care of your family. Do not resist, re resort to robbery. Which, by the way, I haven't heard a single report of any crime coming out of Gaza. There's no food, no water, no nothing. And somehow, the entire world has always told us, oh, we cannot give money to the, uh, the unhoused. Oh, we cannot give money to people who struggle with drug addiction. Oh, that would just help them. Uh, and they would just continue being lazy bums. There is no economy. There is all human st structures have come apart in Gaza. And yet somehow it's running. And it's not Hamas. And it's not Israel. It's the people themselves. Take a lesson from these people. See how they respond. Till today, the accusations that are leveled at any pro-Palestinian is, you just want to kill us. You just want to destroy the Jews. Ah, you're not even telling the truth. All of this is, ah, that's an anti-Semitic sweatshirt. That's an anti-Semitic uh, uh, tagline, what a chant, anything. But I really don't see the level of anti-Semitism that they're saying. Norman Finkelstein is trying to rehabilitate the reality of if anti-Semitism did come out of the mouth of someone who suffered from Israeli aggression, it would be understood. Thank you, but I don't see the level of anti-Semitism. I don't see the racism. In fact, I see SJPs, and I see AMP, and I see Palestinians, and I see Muslim leaders even, say we are not anti semitic For God's sake, the Hamas charter in 2017 says this is not about Jews. We have no problem with them. This is about the Israeli occupation. We will not be bullied anymore by the stinky rhetoric of the veneer. And I think that the world has now woken up in the form of the, the declaration in the UN. Enough is enough. You want to support Israel, you will be a pariah state. That is what is going to happen to you. And this fake stone architecture that you've built, that you're hiding behind and waging war, and you're hiding behind these palm trees that you have planted, are going to get cut down, they're being found out, and your homes will collapse on top of you and it didn't come from a single bomb or a single bullet from the other side. It comes by your own damn hands. Wa'il Dahdu is an inspiration. The people of Gaza are an inspiration. They are my inspiration. And I hope they've taught us all the lesson of resetting the balance and learning about calamity. Calamity, which is the great moral criterion. ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عن سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار 
ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا أذاب النار يا رب I ask you to forgive us forgive our sins forgive us for our anger and protect us from its resulting manifestation hatred allow us to be those who reset the scales who don't seek vengeance but seek righteousness and seek to put things right the way that you have taught us through your prophets and in particular your prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam and allow us to uphold the deputyship in which you have offered us to lead by example now that everything else is falling apart the veneers and the stones of international law and morality and law in general have been destroyed allow muslims to arise and awake finally to be the flag bearers of a moral sharia because that is what a sharia is allow us to uphold your values and your ethics and to be the ones who will cause the change for our new world with our gardens that will be grown and the light that will emanate from the land of Palestine in particular.